more Davite SCPs. The Davite Empire is one centered around blood and sacrifice, a civilization that has been a scourge for thousands of years, and despite all odds, can't quite be put down completely. This is largely due to their thaumaturgical elements, their magical rituals that were largely achieved through sacrifice. I've covered the Davites briefly before in one of my first SCP videos, but this time we'll be continuing to look at a few more anomalies catalogued by the Foundation in connection with the Davite Empire. As a short recap, the Davites are mainly focused around a single SCP, SCP-140, which is a book that continually expands on the Davite history whenever a fluid suitable for writing comes into contact with it. A book that writes itself isn't that worrisome, except that the expanded history written in the book becomes actual history, retroactively changing reality to suit the book's writings. This means that the Davite civilization continues to progress through history, even if earlier reports indicate that they had collapsed or fallen, as the book rewrites events to prolong their empire. The real concern is that there are multiple copies of this book in existence, and each one is capable of continually adding to the history of the Davites, with the possibility that, if left unchecked, the Davites will eventually enter into the modern world, becoming the dominant power of our planet. Rewriting history is a strong theme of Davite materials, as we can see with SCP-2140, an image created by the Foundation depicting glyphs in a redacted script. This image can only be viewed by loyal Foundation personnel, with a fairly high clearance level in relation to 2140. These individuals have highly corroborated personal histories consistent with their profile, including known Foundation colleagues and documentation. What this really means though is not that only loyal Foundation personnel are capable of seeing this image, but that the image itself alters reality whenever someone views it, so that the individual becomes a loyal Foundation member. The individual has no idea that a change occurred, and for all intents and purposes, they were always a loyal Foundation member, looking at a mundane image. The Foundation suspects that this anomaly follows a path of least resistance altering the minimum amount of details necessary in order for a person to end up in the Foundation with clearance to access the image. No records exist of any person without the appropriate background and clearance level viewing the image, but then there wouldn't be, would there? A separate tale suggests that the Foundation routinely utilizes the image on groups of dangerous D-Class individuals in order to recruit more Foundation personnel. The Foundation is usually a bit more squeamish about altering history, but you can't argue with those results. The image was created by the Foundation through a project based on a different image they recovered from a dig site in Uzbekistan. Apparently the dig site was already suspicious due to the likelihood of mimetic hazards, and when some irregularities were noted in the dig team's reports, an MTF was sent in. They ended up facing heavy resistance from the dig team, and it was revealed afterwards that the researchers and security personnel of the dig team were all part of a covert cell within the foundation. Additionally, three of the MTF that went in were revealed to be part of another deep cell within the foundation, despite them coming from three different continents and knowing each other for less than a year. They were all killed, attempting to access SCP-140. Of course, really what happened is that the dig team uncovered an image that changed their histories, so that they were not loyal Foundation members, but rather were servants to the ancient Davite Empire. When they filed their reports, they tried to do so as Davite servants, not as loyal Foundation personnel, which is what led to some irregularities. One of the MTF that went in found the image and was changed as well, 
who then proceeded to purposefully show the image to two other agents. Eventually, the foundation caught on, and basically broke up the image and put the fragments into deep storage. They then began a project to recreate the image, but altered it so that it changed people into foundation personnel instead. Now, the only real concern is that the original Davite image might have been plastered all over the place, or could continually crop up due to the new history from SCP-140. Continuing with the theme of altering history, SCP-5711 is a ritual capable of altering the course of historical events, developed by the Davites, potentially as recently as 200 BCE. The Foundation has been very actively pursuing the destruction of any information related to the ritual, to the point of they're not even sure the full details of the ritual themselves. They do know it involves at least a mechanical device of indeterminate function, constructed of a beryllium bronze alloy, a half liter of blood, presumably from the lead officiant of the ritual, at least three additional witnesses slash participants, an altar or temple complex, and one prepubescent human child. They have uncovered many similarities between modern Sarkic cults slash Church of the Broken God sects and religious practices of the ancient Davites, suggesting that the ritual was developed utilizing classical mechanist and Sarkic religious texts. It's believed that the intended target of the ritual was a period either immediately prior to or during the Second Punic War, likely to change the outcome of that conflict. The temple complex that was built to carry out this ritual consists of several small residential dwellings, an open-air temple, and a large flat pyramid with a recessed top containing an altar. The interior of the pyramid contains several damaged pieces of anomalous machinery, and beneath it is a network of tunnels connecting the complex, along with some vast open pits with depths greater than 100 meters. At some point, a temporal restructuring event occurred at the site of this temple complex, resulting in the sudden appearance of a massive black dome. Two hours later, the dome disappeared, and an MTF went in to investigate. Monitoring devices over 200 kilometers away picked up a flux in tachyons from the event, and calculations suggest that it was likely the most powerful known temporal event in Foundation history. When the team arrives, they split up, with some checking out the residential dwellings while the rest head into the pyramid. The team checking the dwelling finds blood all over the place, with a body on the floor. Although they shoot it in the foot with no reaction, when they turn the body over, it suddenly animates, with a bright flash seen over its hand. They put a few more rounds into the head, and it ceases activity. As for the others, they are being led by Captain Regina Watts, who I have to give some information on. The entire team is designed to work around temporal anomalies, but Watts is an experimental user of a drug developed by the Foundation based on a temporal virus. Essentially, this drug, taken by her in the form of cigarettes, allows someone to travel briefly backwards into the past. Normally, this isn't that useful, as most users tend to just forget what they witnessed or it otherwise screws with their head, but Watts has a rather unique resistance to amnestics, which allows her to generally remember everything she experiences. This means that she can use this drug to redo events, gaining a huge tactical advantage in dangerous situations, although she's the only one on the team that utilizes these drugs. The individual running communications for the team noticed that her pack of cigarettes was too short at the start of the mission, and he asks her privately if she's already on her third loop. She signals that she is, and she doesn't want the others to know. When asked how many casualties there was the first two times, she says seven, despite there being only five on the team. 
Back in the dwellings, one of the team finds a desk containing a journal and a number of other ritual materials, such as an ornamental dagger and dried herbs. While investigating, one of the walls bulges inwards and explodes, with the two agents opening fire through the opening. Meanwhile, Watts and the other two agents are attacked by hostile individuals in the open temple area, but easily dispatch them. Watts then notifies the agents in the dwellings that a hostile will be coming through the door in a couple seconds. They dispatch them, but wonder if Watts wants to tell the team anything. Watts just says that she's busy as they deal with more hostiles before she drops her radio and begins sprinting towards the pyramid, obviously aware of something the rest of the team isn't. The team is informed that she's on her third loop and that something is likely quite wrong. The two that were with Watts chase after her into the pyramid, finding two bodies in unmarked tactical gear in the entrance. One of them finds some Davite glyphs that render them mute, and they find three more bodies with tactical gear alongside five figures in classical Davite ritual clothing, with signs of burning around their palms and eyes. Gunfire continues to ring out across the temple complex as they uncover more bodies before reaching an elevated platform at the center of the pyramid. Here, they find over a dozen bodies, along with a bronze mechanical apparatus and the body of a female child. Moving past this area onto a thin platform, they find Captain Watts, sitting on the floor with her gun in her hand. She appears to be rather shaken, but puts the gun down as one of the team steps around her to a body on the floor wearing tactical gear. Upon removing the mask, they find it to be a match for Captain Watts, with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the temple. The transcript ends here, but we're given some excerpts from a journal recovered from the dwellings, written by a man named Khazard bin Alarath. Alarath is believed to be one of the last remaining blood descendants of the Davite priesthood, and considers SCP-5711 to be his life's work. The first entry speaks of Alarath finding some other descendants of Davite blood hiding amongst the Sarkites. He wonders how many of their people have been lost to time or are contained by the Foundation, and he hungers for the days to come. He mentions SCP-140, and although it may be lost to them, there are copies of it that could bring about their promised future. In the second entry, he curses the Roman Empire for mocking the Davite legacy and bringing about their downfall. He ponders if the ones who lived among the Sarkites may know of a way to alter history and cleanse it of the Roman perversion. In the third entry, Alaroth writes that he has brought in seven members that were formerly of the Church of the Broken God. Although they are suspicious of the Sarkites, Alarath believes that he can unify them. They brought with them a copy of SCP-140, and Alarath thinks that if history is altered so that Hannibal was a Davite, it could completely change reality. As for the bronze apparatus, the ones that came from the church are well accustomed to forging metal, but the Sarkites are wary of it. Alarath says that they will each sleep with an ingot of bronze beneath their pillows to help them understand, and if they don't, they will be used as part of the foundation of the temple. In the next entry, he elaborates on this, stating that a sacrifice of five individuals was performed to create the foundation of the temple. The former church members are working on the divine machine while the former Sarkites are working on the arts of flesh. Although Alarath doesn't mention details about the ritual, he does say that it is less elegant than SCP-140, and it may be difficult to find a suitable offering and setting. We have to assume that the copy of 140 possessed by them doesn't function the same as the one contained by the Foundation, otherwise it would be a simple matter of just filling it with writing fluid to recreate history. 
The journal finishes with Alaroth praising the genius of the ancient Davites and how they found the perfect offering, which combined with the flesh crafter's eye to anatomy and the machinist's divine artifice will manifest their destiny. Unfortunately, the last entry, likely written during the event, is written in a much sloppier style, with Alaroth writing that their triumph is dashed to rubble, and he wonders why their god has left them. Lastly, we have an audio recording from Captain Watts that she recorded during the mission, although she doesn't currently remember recording it. In the recording, she says that ten of them went into the pyramid during the event, with eight of them dropping before they made into the ritual chamber due to the large number of hostiles. She and a man named Sergeant Russell, of which the Foundation has no record of, entered the ritual chamber and found the cultists cutting pieces off of the young girl hanging in the middle. The two of them slaughtered the group but more hostiles emerged from upstairs and killed Russell with a dagger. Watts ran for cover, leaving behind a glyph in one of the stairwells, SCP-2140. This will cause any of the cultists who look at it to instantly become loyal Foundation members, and change history to suit it, which would certainly mess with the cult a bit. Watts then reveals that she's recording this during her 20th loop. She finishes by saying that if you're listening to this, know that the world was once okay and that the good guys went down swinging. She says that she tried and she's sorry it wasn't enough before shooting herself. Whatever Watts managed to do in there seems to have worked to maintain normalcy, as the world is not currently controlled by the Davites. Watts is nominated for the Foundation's Silver Star Award, but since it's only given out to those that die in the line of duty, and technically she's still very much alive, this is denied. This is a bit of a tricky SCP, as it definitely requires a bunch of knowledge of other concepts within the universe, but it just shows how dangerous the Davites continue to be as a group. Not only do they have descendants that are continually focused on rewriting history to expand the Davite Empire, this expanded history continues to add more and more Davite descendants and anomalies. Another rather wild Davite SCP is SCP-4008, an anomaly based around Foundation Site-183, which may or may not exist. In the Foundation database, there exist full records of the site, the personnel that worked there, and the anomalies it contained, but no physical evidence of the site's existence can be found, and no one in the Foundation has any memory of the site or its staff. The location where this site is said to be is completely devoid of structures or signs of life, only some dead trees. It's possible that the area is a bit more of a desert than the surrounding area, but even that is a little inconclusive. According to records, Site 183 was responsible for the research and containment of anomalous historical artifacts and documents. Supposedly, there were 64 anomalous objects on site, four of which were fully documented as SCPs, but none of them have been accounted for. What this means is either Foundation records have been altered, meaning that this was never a real place, there's a memetic or anti-memetic anomaly at work that is removing or suppressing knowledge of this place, or Site-183 has been physically moved or altered from our reality through some anomalous means. The Foundation is leaning against some sort of temporal alteration, as typically that would remove all evidence of it existing from their database, but they're not ruling anything out. After performing a modified seismic survey, the Foundation found that there were a number of solid masses below the supposed location of the site, between 300 and 700 meters down. They begin excavating immediately. 
After digging for a while, they uncovered the shattered and collapsed remains of a standard Foundation site living quarters. Inside, they managed to find the remains of a personal journal, although much of it was illegible. The parts that are legible talk about some lost cities, such as Atlantis and El Dorado, and how there is likely a common link between them, some sort of common cause that destroyed them. The writer also discusses someone who they find hard to believe ever existed at all, despite all evidence to the contrary, whose history is all over the place, likely referring to the Davites. The writer was going to submit a proposal to investigate something, but the rest of the journal is illegible. The Foundation continues to excavate, as clearly something pretty bad happened to this site, with no info on what exactly that was. They find a bunch of standard containment cells, or what's left of them, along with the on-site nuclear device, which is still intact. By this point, they still have not found any of the dozens of anomalous objects that were supposed to be contained here. They eventually find the central server unit for the site, and after some work by data recovery technicians, they manage to recover a series of audio logs submitted by a Dr. Daniel Roberts, a historian and archaeologist assigned to the site. Most of these audio logs were corrupted, so we're just given some fragments. The first log has Dr. Roberts claiming to be at a site Alpha, which he describes as an arid place with little plant life. He says the spot is no Atlantis, but they might discover something here. Twenty days later, however, he says that if there was something here, they would have found it by now, and there's apparently multiple sites like this they plan on visiting. A few days later, they progress to a site Beta, which is also sparse in vegetation. A few weeks go by, and Roberts states that Site Beta is a bust, with them planning on moving on tomorrow. It's been nearly two months now, and they've discovered nothing, leaving the team frustrated. Their search is based on a theory developed by Dr. Roberts, and he admits that, although he could be wrong, and there's nothing at these sites, he'd rather not think about that just yet. They move on to a site Gamma, where they actually find something buried in the ground. They don't know quite what it is yet, but they found it practically straight away after coming to the site. A couple of days later, he announces that they uncovered a ruined structure, which sounds pretty familiar. He states that the structure was ruined through more than just natural deterioration. Instead, it's like something smashed through the top of it and dragged it underground. They found clay fragments and pieces of worked metal, along with some skeletons with large holes in their chests. Ten days later, he says that they've made some remarkable discoveries here. They found a number of anomalous objects, mostly pretty minor stuff like a quill that produces its own ink. He says that in the distant past, use of anomalies such as these were far more common, at least in the upper classes of society. The structures they've uncovered at this site were not mansions though, instead just simple houses, or maybe a trading outpost. All they really can deduce about what happened here is that it happened fast, and it utterly destroyed every building here. Every structure they've uncovered has been completely obliterated, some smashed together into a ruined mass and the structures were scattered across all sorts of different depths underground. The only exception to this is a circular area in what they guess would be the center of the city, around 100 meters across, where they didn't find a single ruin. Another couple weeks go by, and even though they've only scratched the surface of things to discover here, apparently they have a schedule to maintain, so they move on to the next site. Robert suspects that there must have been survivors of the event here, or people that knew about it, and he hopes to find more info at Site Delta. Unfortunately, there was nothing at Delta, and they eventually moved on to Site Epsilon, 
where after 17 days, they finally found something. It appears to be the same sort of ruins they found at Gamma, but much smaller, possibly a small town or military outpost. Two days later, Robert says he's pretty certain this was a military camp, as they found a number of weapons and scraps of armor. He deduces that this was some sort of forward post to ward against Davite incursion, as they would have had a clear view for miles to see any approaching armies. It seems that the Davites didn't need an army though. On day 21 at Epsilon, they managed to actually find the remains of a deva. Robert says it's uncomfortable to look at, like something in the back of his brain is screaming at him to run away. The body is getting shipped back for analysis, but it did have some documents on it that have been anomalously preserved in some way. After translating them, they indicate that the deceased Deva was leading a small group with the goal of infiltrating and destroying this outpost, using an unnamed weapon or magic. It's unclear whether this was intended as a suicide mission or if something just went wrong, but the documents indicate a Davite outpost hidden in the mountains nearby. The team decides to pack up and try and find this outpost. It takes them a couple days, but they do. Robert says that it's a treasure trove of Davite history, containing minor anomalous objects, preserved documents, artwork, and Davite weaponry. They also find something like a seed, big enough to fill your palm, encased in a translucent crystalline material. The seed was clearly given a place of reverence in the outpost, and looking at it, physically hurts Roberts, feeling like needles stabbing through his eyes. He says he's heading back to Site 183 to research everything they found here. Ten days after discovering that Site 183 didn't seem to exist, a group of Foundation personnel made contact with another site. They matched the identities of a number of individuals that were documented as working at Site 183 and they claimed that they had been working at a dig site until eight days ago when they all began to realize that they had no memory of why they were working there. It took them eight days to travel on foot to the nearest site, with none of their communication equipment working due to it being connected to a non-responsive site, 183. The individuals seemed to have no memory of site 183 or any of the work they did there, but the Foundation checked out the dig site they were at and did find the ruins of a partially unearthed city. They uncovered Dr. Roberts' initial proposal on the site's server, in which he essentially proposes that a number of lost cities bordering the ancient Davite Empire were all destroyed through some sort of common cause. Each location he has in mind is unusually barren compared to the area around it, Historical records of surrounding regions show a number of events that could be explained by the sudden disappearance of a major city, and the areas in question have a known history of conflict with the Davites. He proposes that he takes a team to check out these sites in order to uncover more information about the Davites, which he did. The final document we're given that was found on the server is a work-in-progress SCP document for the seed that Roberts found, mostly based on the document they found with it. It's believed to be a plant developed by the Davites to function as a weapon of mass destruction. The seed itself possesses a mild cognitohazardous effect, causing a painful sensation to anyone that looks at it. When planted, however, it will immediately begin to grow at an incredibly advanced rate developing into a fully grown tree in around 5 minutes. This tree will measure between 1.2 and 1.5 kilometers tall, with a trunk diameter averaging around 70 meters. Roots grow outward from the tree to a distance of around 3 kilometers, ranging from 50 meters above ground to over 900 meters below. 
This growing process will leach significant quantities of minerals and water from the ground. Once fully grown, the tree produces an anti-memetic effect, causing anyone affected to lose all memories of anything within the area containing the tree. The way it achieves this is rather unique believed to be caused by an anomalous alteration to the electromagnetic spectrum, meaning that all visible light contains this anti-meme. Essentially, once the tree is grown, the anti-memetic effect covers the globe almost instantly. After around an hour, the tree will rapidly begin to break down into gas and particulate matter within 10 minutes, leaving nothing behind. The ground, displaced by the massive tree, will collapse, burying anything on the surface and leaving behind only a barren area of land. The document found with the seed contains some text from the Davites, where they state that the tree's roots will tear the land, and its leaves will rend the sky itself, shattering men's minds. Thousands of Davites died so that they could acquire this seed of destruction, and now their blood will be carried into eternity by the tree's branches. Dr. Roberts finishes the document by stating that they're going to do some testing on these three seeds they found, and see what they can discover. The Foundation has yet to find any of the seeds mentioned in the document. So. What obviously happened is that Dr. Roberts inadvertently activated one of these seeds while experimenting with it at Site-183, and it proceeded to grow and demolish the entire site. The anti-memetic effect spread across the globe and wiped out everyone's memory of the site, but this effect did absolutely nothing to the Foundation's database. This meant that, in a rather unique situation, the site was destroyed, no one remembers it, but the records are completely unaltered. Still, the Davites developed quite a weapon of mass destruction here, basically a botanical nuke. As usual with the Davites, everything connects back to SCP-140. Those seeds might not have even existed in reality 50 years ago but continual progress from SCP-140 or other anomalies like it continue to expand on Davite history, adding more and more to our reality. This is why the Davites are such a big threat, as the Foundation really has very little control over history being rewritten like this. More weapons of mass destruction could spontaneously appear, and more Davite cultists that are interested in spreading them and all the Foundation can do is keep a watchful eye. Mussolini once said that it is blood which moves the wheels of history, and I think for the Davites, that continues to be very true.